I was able to probably fill two or three of these kind of notebooks, these spiral bound notebooks that you get in college with what I desperately want is to, from the depths of my soul, connect with other people who are feeling like me and let them know they're not alone. Let them know that this there's another way. In Character Talks, we aim to unearth the hidden gems of human resilience, courage, and growth. We bring you tales of ordinary people who found themselves in extraordinary circumstances and emerged from the crucible of life forever changed. From tales of facing fear head on, to serendipitous encounters that altered destinies, and from travels to distant lands that broadened horizons. To battles fought within, we believe that every experience holds the potential to shape us in profound ways. I'm Chris Christie, and this is Character Talks. Just after it's been cut. And wade through the stream or maybe run through the river Even though you may get just a little bit wet A bum bum she do A bum bum she do Wow, 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 wow This is, this is life Welcome back, adventurers, to another episode of Character Talks. We are excited to bring you part two of our conversation with the incredible Michelle Rios, host of the Live Your Extraordinary Life podcast. In our previous episode, Michelle shared her inspiring journey from the corporate world to a life marked by authenticity and purpose. Today, we dive deeper into the profound question that often nudges us towards transformation, if not now, when? Join us as we delve into the belief that each of us possess a unique gift and the profound insights Michelle shares on how to channel these gifts to a purposeful and authentic life. Michelle's transformative journey from the corporate world to a life guided by love and authenticity is not only inspiring, but serves as a guiding light for those seeking a similar path. Get ready for an engaging dialogue that emphasizes the transformative power of love and purpose and creating a truly extraordinary life. We're gonna begin this podcast in the middle of our conversation. So here we go with Michelle and part two. Let them know that this there's another way, because then the way started to appear, and I didn't know the way out. The way just sort of appeared because I was willing to pause, as you said, and for a moment entertain the notion that the way my mind was perceiving my reality might not be accurate, and that my emotions might be hijacked by wrong thinking in my brain. And that I needed to actually sit back instead of do, 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 do. Very masculine energy. And I was steeped in it. And be aware that there is this connection to something higher than me, which wasn't entirely new. I will give my parents great credit for this. I knew from a very early age that I was a spiritual being having a human experience, but I got really stuck in my humanness, really stuck in (laughs) it. I believed in my humanness and my human reality to be the reality in the 3D dimension. Forget about any 4D or 5D, whatever. That just sounds very woo-woo. And I was very steeped in what is experience. I'm experiencing the here and now is all there is. And what I see, I can believe it. uh, I will believe it when I see it. And for the first time ever, I was understanding notions and coming in contact with concepts like Wayne Dyer's, you'll see it when you believe it. And I was like, that must be a misprint. And no, it was this idea that in order to manifest, in order to have an experience that is outside of where you are now, you must first start to visualize it. It must be a thought in the mind and before it becomes something in the reality. And I remember thinking that is so profoundly different than anything I've ever thought before. It was just, so my whole world started to shift pretty quickly. I was still in a corporate environment, still going through the graduate school experience, but with a 
notion of step back for a minute, maybe this is like, the, you know, we didn't have the matrix back then, but this is kind of like a game and I need to be an observer. That was the first time I thought I need to be an observer in my life. That and that's what, and that's what, yeah. That, and that, one. and that's what jumps into my head was you went through a series of, of questions. What am I doing? Who am, who am I? The, and you just did it. And I, you did it without judgment. You didn't, you ask the questions and so many people, I think, ask questions and then they like almost create the answer for themselves. And and I think it's important that when you ask the questions and you pause and you just kind of sat at that moment that you just let, you didn't have any preconceived notions. And I'm not sure how, if I'm saying it as well, accurately I mean, as, as, let, as I let want. Let me say, I, I am not that bright. I am a very intelligent woman, but I needed outside influences to open my mind and crack me open to new possibilities. So my trips to the bookstore were profoundly eye-opening because I was starting to find literature that was contrarian to the way I believed the world to work. And that was really important in order to test whether or not I was so wedded to the way I thought and lived previously that I would be unable to change. Or if there was a possibility that I was missing part of the equation of life. And I was pleasantly surprised that I was missing a lot of the equation and that I was working way too hard and yeah. that I was seeing things very black and white and only in 3D. And the reality is there's so much more. And I needed to not work harder, slow down in order to see it. You cannot experience it when you're going 150 miles an hour. Right. You can't. There's no space. And the growth space and this is a really important thing for listeners. If you are going through a really horrendous time, and a lot of people are, hold on to hope because at the end of a really horrendous experience, bad things, all the things that you think is the possibility that the light is waiting for you because growth cannot come without pain. You do not find growth in a comfortable space. Think about birth. When a child comes into the world, it is not a pleasant experience, right? They are pushing their way through birth canal that is not big enough for them, that is <laughs> shoving them into the reality, right? There is something uncomfortable to be had to birth this new life. And it is the same way that we as humans go through personal growth. You don't go through growth during the good times. Growth follows the difficult moments. So if you are in a difficult moment, this is actually a moment of gratitude. And I know that sounds loony, but be, thank you. I know my time is coming. I know the growth experience is coming. I know the lesson is going to be found for me. And we go through this at every level of life. It's not like I experienced that at 26 and, oh, it's been smooth sailing ever since. Contrary, it's like, it's like reaching another level in the video game, right? It gets harder or new or different and the obstacles change. But as you get better and you learn how to maneuver this life, you get better at playing the game of life. You get better at knowing how to manifest what you want. And so for me, a lot of the huge lessons, those aha moments at 26, I had another one right around 34 where my grandmother literally the week before she died, she came to visit me and we all went to Maine. I was living in DC, but we all went to visit her. She'd been living in uh, Atlanta with my aunt and uncle and she wanted to see the family that summer. We all kind of sensed that this might be her last big trip. She's in her nineties. She's getting older, sharp as a tack, still, you know, full of, as Mainers would say, piss and vinegar <laughs> and um, doesn't miss a beat, but she's getting older. So we all trek back home to be with my parents and my grandmother and spend time all together. And we're on a boat one day and my grandmother goes, looks around and I was married, no children. My sister was married, no children. And my brother had been dating the same woman for five years. And we're all in our thirties at this point. And my grandmother said, for the love of God, have the baby, have the baby, marry the girl. And we were all like, ha, ha, ha. That's so funny. Well, my grandmother went home from that trip. And on the very day she arrived, she died instantly. 
after she had her best meal and sat down to watch her Jeopardy and whatever her show, you know, shows at the end of the evening, after, right. you know, the evening news and everything, she was gone in less than a minute. She had a massive stroke and heart attack and um, God took her instantly. And I made the truck home because she was going to go be buried in Maine. I made the truck home. I was the speech writer. I was a communications person. So, and I would be the one doing the eulogy, of course. And so I'm preparing and doing all this and recounting her stories of her life. And this is a woman who worked for the Hathaway shirt company in Waterville, Maine for 52 years. She never spoke a bad word in her life of, to anybody about anybody, just the kindest Irish granny you could ever want. And for me, Growing up with a 16-year-old mother and an 18-year-old father, she was my safe haven. You know, my parents are lovely people, but they were kids. You know, who are we kidding? I have a 16-year-old. I don't leave him with the dog. And I love him very <laughs> much and he's responsible, but like a baby. And, you know, my parents' inability to know how to communicate as youngsters themselves meant I felt alone a lot as a little kid. And my grandmother was everything to me. And my dad is the youngest of eight. So I was at the bottom of all the grandchildren, the oldest of my family, but we are the bottom three. When she died, we go to her funeral. We're in this church. And this was another massive aha moment for me. Here I am, you know, cosmopolitan lady that I have become, you know, I have become, you know, this very sophisticated uh, career woman and all the things, right. Um, I've gone to graduate school. I've traveled the world. I'm very refined. I show up in Maine and, you know, not stilettos because those are never my thing, but you know, my very lovely clothes and what have you, where everyone's like, seriously, we're in the main woods, like get some flannels and be done with yourself. <laughs> but I, you know, I'm showing up and I want to make my grandmother proud and everyone proud and all of this and do right by her. And I'm looking out and I'm realizing, oh, I need these people. Who are these people at my grandmother's funeral? Like all her friends are gone. And it's just like a few of my family members, but it's packed. I mean, it's packed, it's standing room only. And so all of these people from the community have shown up to pay their respects to her because this woman who didn't have anything more than eighth grade education, never had a career outside of being a seamstress working for, you know, minimum wage and raised, you know, children and was a very simple woman, had more impact on her community and on her family and made people understand what it is to be unconditionally loved than I had ever experienced or had on anybody in my 34 years on the planet. And in that moment, I realized that all of these lovely words that I had strung together for my grandmother, true that they are, and she was a woman of fortitude and overcome so many obstacles, losing children before she died, three of her own children dying before she did, losing my grandfather, overcoming cancer at a time when nobody overcame cancer in the seventies. You were a goner. If you got right. that kind of cancer, she overcame it. I sat there going, oh my God, this lesson is for me again. This isn't even about just doing right by my grandma. This is like, she's like, hey, another lesson for Michelle. Aha moment. You wanted to be a woman of impact and substance. This is how you show up to be a woman of impact and substance. You love people every day, just where they're at. You don't judge people. You work an honest living. You do your best to do right by people. You give more than you take. You show up when people need you. You show up even if they don't need you and you always bring food. And I thought I was going as the person that was, I don't know, not more important. That's definitely like the wrong way to think, but I'm pretty sure some of my ego in there was like, I'm pretty important and all of this. And I just got like whacked upside the head with the most important person in this room and the person that you have dreamt to be like, but you had no idea that you were wishing to be like the person that you knew all along. She was always here in your life. You always had her as an example. And you have been searching 600 miles away in another city on how to become this person that you already knew how to be because she modeled it for you every day of your life growing up. Eye-opening moment, eye-opening moment, profoundly humbling experience. It was... I'm a very strong woman and I was trembling giving this eulogy. One, she was an incredibly important person in my life, but it was also a very bring you to your knees kind of moment of God saying, 
This is what I have been trying to tell you. It does not matter how many degrees you have on your wall. It does not matter how many countries you have visited. It does not matter how much bank you have made. It does not matter what zip code you live in. It does not matter who sits at your dinner table and who use, whose table you get to sit at. What matters is how you show up every day. Which then brings us to your word. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's really all of that brings you back to the word. Normally, I would have the the guest, you know, say the word, but of course, it's going to be on the cover of the podcast, so people will know <laughs> with authenticity. And the only research I do in preparation for a podcast, because I try to come in as a first time listener and try to ask questions, and I I find myself limiting the number of questions that I've asked at this time or saying because you're just dropping gems left and right. And I hope people, when they listen to this podcast, I hope they just hit, have it on the replay button that it just continually rolls and rolls because there's so much, there's so much in that. Uh, and but when I look up the word on authenticity in the dictionary, it says to be genuine. And those are word, two words that you and I both talked about previously, though. Those are the two words that I think guide both of us are, or a part of our, our guiding is genuine and authentic. So then I go to genuine. And I go look up that definition and it says, truly what something is said to be, to be authentic. Mm. Mm, it gives me goosebumps. So what is your, what is Michelle's definition? If I being authentic, how would you, because I think on the front page of the character mill is what defines who you are. Authentic defines who you are, but how do you define being authentic? You know, it's an interesting way of, I'll tell you the answer and then how I came to come to this point. To me, authenticity means showing up as the most true version of yourself and the most true version of myself or of yourself and of anybody here means we need to take off all the personas. Personas is Latin term means masks, all the titles, all the roles we play, all of the things we identify. Like I would say, hi, my name is Michelle Ria. So I'm a podcast host and an entrepreneur and I'm writing a book. And yeah, okay, put that aside. The authentic me, that part that always has been and always will be is part of the pure consciousness, that spirit level awareness is this very gentle, humble, grateful, happy, content space. I didn't want to call it a being. I mean, maybe it is, but I think of it as light. If someone was to say, how do you feel at your most authentic self? I feel like I am light and that the light in me is meant to be something that I bring forward in the world in order to light the way for others who are in darkness still. And I'm pausing because I hope people will will let that sink. And I would add the part that jumped into me that the note that I wrote was when you were talking about the other things, the podcaster, the entrepreneur, you are living without ego. And it's something that I talked, I recently just spoke to my athletes about that we we were going to play with confidence and without ego, because there's a massive difference between those two things. And so when I was hearing you say that, that where, you, you know, I am the podcaster and those things, that was ego and, Absolutely. and, and all the, the things that you just described. Status. Yeah. Ego loves, ego loves status. status. Yeah. And look, look, there's nothing wrong with it. The ego is here to keep us safe. That's mm -hmm. the reality. The ego yeah. is here to keep us safe, but the ego will also keep you small. And yeah. that's something I hope people hear. Because well, that's big. That's, oh, I love that. I the love ego that. Will keep you small. Just and here's small. why the ego does not like change. And when you are in a state of enlightenment, when you are in a place of awareness, when you have a moment of going, oh, oh, now I get it. Wait, I wasn't even aware that this is possible or this way was even valid or what have you. The ego is like, it's not. Forget what that just said. Like, <laughs> ignore the soul. Your soul is lying to you. You're going to die. Like, bad things will happen. You'll have nothing in your bank account and the, your cats will eat you. You know, you're going to be all alone in your apartment and no one will ever come visit you. 
if you do those things. And that's the lie. That's the big right. lie because our ego only knows things from a human perspective, right? And we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And so there's always going to be this battle between the ego and the spirit. There's always going to be this place for the ego to say, and for us to be able to say, I got it. I know you're worried about me. You want to keep me safe. I'm so grateful. Now get out of the way. Um, because you're holding us back from being who we're meant to be while we're here. And it is, it is inevitable. If you allow yourself to be ruled by the thoughts in your mind. Okay. I want everyone to hear this by the thoughts in your mind versus the knowing in your soul. Some of you will say in my heart, that's fine. Whatever you want to call it. If you allow your thoughts thoughts to be the, what drives your actions, you are selling yourself short because you are acting from the egoic mind. That is the place where it's not that they're bad ideas. They're good ideas. They're safe ideas. They're also ideas that will keep you small. So I'll tell you, my egoic mind said, Michelle, you have arrived at a really high place in the world. You are a corporate executive. You're in the C-suite. You're making bank. You live in Washington, D.C. Life is good. You get to go home, visit your family. And my soul said, now it's time to leave. Mm -hmm. And my ego goes, what the what? No, 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 no. Do not listen to that part of you. That part of you is crazy. That's woo-woo. You don't know what you're talking about. We are doing really well over here. It's super comfortable. Go watch another Netflix series. And while you're there, get me some Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> um, okay. But my spirit says, I'm so glad that you worked so hard to get us here. And now it's time to take your work and do other things and trust that what you're going to do next, you might not know the how but it's all going to be okay because you have a role to play. That's bigger than you and bigger than what you're living over here. This is small potatoes. There's a whole universe out there that needs this message. This yeah. is not just for you to live a comfortable, you know, comfortable life, comfortably numb doing wash, rinse and repeat. So I know hi to your career. We're going to walk out and your ego is going to flip right the, you know, what out. <laughs> which is exactly what happened right on cue where I was like, are you serious? And we're doing what? We're starting a podcast. Okay. We're starting a podcast. And here's the thing. If you're open to it. And I really say like a lot of people, like, how do you pay your bills? Look, it is really strange when you are open to allowing your spirit to guide you, things will fall into place. And I know it sounds wacky and I know it sounds woo woo, but I am one of the most practical people on the planet and for me to be able to say, I trust that after having done it the way my ego has demanded it of me for a very long time with levels of consciousness and awareness happening, like we don't necessarily walk around sleepwalking our whole lives. I had moments of awareness for sure, but none like this last time where it was boom, you're super comfortable. You're super content. Now it's time to get uncomfortable again. You need to write a book. And I immediately was like, who am I to write a book? And then we go through the battle. The ego goes, who are you to write a book? What do you know about writing a book? Who makes, who, what makes you think that anyone's going to listen to your book or read your book? Like, boy, you must think you're somebody important. And then my soul is like, it isn't about you. It isn't about you. You just need to write the book, but it is not about you. It's about what you can give and you're just a portal. So get over yourself and write the book. And, and it was one of those experiences of saying, well, then I need to create the space. You will not be able to have that moment of reckoning and awareness in your life about what you were called here to do. If you are filling every minute of the day with activity. That is just the reality. So you talked about the fact that you meditate and I will tell you, I am new to meditation and I'm not particularly good at it, which is <laughs> why I'm now getting certified in it. Because I figured if you suck at something, if you practice hard enough, they'll give you a certification so that you can at least say I'm modestly good, moderately good. We'll see. 
but I wasn't creating any space. I was purposely trying to not have space because if I had space, then that voice in my soul would have a big seat at the head of the table in the decision-making and my ego would lose it. So you know what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't want to have the battle. I was tired. I'm in my early fifties. This is the time we're supposed to wind down, right? No, no. That was the time we're supposed to ramp up. <laughs> this is the ramping up. And that was the message I received loud and clear about five years ago. So it's been some work in progress, but you know, my soul's like, now is your time. Everything before here, guess what? That was research. Now we get really busy doing the work you were called to do. This is why you've been here. You want to know why you've had this illustrious career in communications so that you can communicate more effectively so that you're a better storyteller so that you can reach more people. You think it didn't serve a purpose. It served a big purpose. You think it was a waste of time? Because I told myself, what a waste of time. I spent all my time over here. No, 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 no. My soul's like exactly where you needed to be in order to get really good. You were in the best places to learn how to do this work. Now we're going to go apply it over here. So I have come to really recognize the fact that if you are open, if you will, Chris, you said it so beautifully at the beginning of this, if you will take a pause, if you will let your soul voice, the voice of your soul speak and just listen. All you have to do is get quiet. Honestly, go for a walk, sit quiet, quiet the noise in your head and wait to see what comes up and don't judge it. Key, right? Don't right. judge it. Quiet the ego and go, huh? Here's the thing. I have never felt more at peace. I have never felt more at flow. I've never felt more aligned. The busy part feels familiar. So I have to kind of navigate that still, but, <laughs> but with great alignment and knowing that there are billions of people on this planet. And if we impact just a fraction of them with the stories, with the message, with the knowing, when you know that there is this other part of you that is your true self, that is your most authentic self. And that if you tap into your most authentic self and you sit with it long enough, it will tell you what you are here to do. You don't need to go search outside of you. You don't need to take another course. You don't need to read another book. It will tell you, this is what you're meant to do. And here's the thing. You're usually in love with that thing. That thing is just something you're naturally really good at. And so this whole, I think for a New Englander, it's almost like, no, I can't take too much joy. It's too much because, you know, we delay joy. At least it was like that way when I was growing up. You work really, really hard. You toil really hard for seven days or six days. And then you relax on the seventh day, right? The Lord's day. And then you can have some fun, let your <laughs> hair down. And Actually, what I've come to the realization is that when you are on purpose and your purpose is deep within you, in you, it is not outside of you. You already have everything you need inside of you. So get quiet and let it speak to you. When you are acting in that place of knowing from your purpose, which is in you already, it is your place of joy. So you get to do something you already like and that you might not be great at, but the more you do it, you're going to get better at it and it's going to feel natural. It's not going to be something that feels that foreign. And that's exactly what's happened for me. I, you know, let's say, well, okay. I got to the pinnacle of a corporate career. I was in the executive, you know, wing and I left. I left because I had a calling and that calling was saying, if not now, when, if not now, when you yeah. are ready you are ready. You are enough. Yeah. If you wait for the right time, the right time never occurs as cliche as that is it's the right time is when is now. <laughs> it's, it's never going to feel, it's yeah. never going to feel hundred percent until you're just in it. And then, you know, and, but we've talked about this as well. The, the number one regret of people on their deathbed is not living a life that was true to them. So if you've ever slowed down enough to hear that call in your soul 
And it's this whisper. That's the thing. Steve Jobs spoke about this on his deathbed. Your soul does not yell. Your ego yells. Your soul Mm. whispers. So get quiet and wait for the whisper. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I need to share something because I before I forget, and and I hope that people that are listening to this understand to the level that I think I'm understanding is that your genuine and authenticity. It's your story is so relatable. Uh, I think so many people will be able to understand, say, oh, yeah, I've gone through something like that, bits and pieces, and to then grasp that and to say, you know what? I can pause and I can take that next step. The The overwhelming feeling for me while listening to you was my meditation. I have to live by the ocean. Now I've lived in Colorado. I've lived in other parts of the country. I have to live near the ocean. I don't do anything on the ocean. <laughs> I just love knowing the that view. I can, I, the view it, it's that it's that boundary. That's not there for me. When I was li- living in Colorado, I loved Colorado but I was, there were mountains all around me and I could enjoy it for a short period of time. If I live on the coast, there's that something, there's that unlimitedness that's there that I, it's just something mental. But when I'm not at my best and I'm letting out the life, whatever, get in my way, my ego, I relate it to sailing in incredibly rough waters. Mm. And then when I meditate, my actual my actual things that I think about when I'm breathing so I can focus on my breath are the swells of a calm ocean. So I when I inhale, I see the swell coming up. And then when I exhale, I see the swell going down. And that is my mental imagery that I go through to, in my personal meditation. And so listening to what you're saying, I, I think about that and go, Boy, all the things that you were going through were the sea of rough waters. And while you might be a sailor, those were rough waters. But you know what they did? They made you an amazing sailor. They made you, they gave you the tools to do, to appreciate when the waters got calm to say, you then looked around and you saw a sign for mental, a mental health center, or you saw these other things and you saw perhaps a purpose when you, but you had to have those skills. You had to have those skills of navigating through those rough waters to be able to then appreciate the calm. And I think that was the, just the part that kept coming into me was that, boy, when people, as tough as things are going for people, if they just took a moment and said, man, these are giving me skills to do yeah. such amazing things. If I just pause, if I just take that minute, and try to get into the the calm waters for a moment, and then, like you said, things will just things appear. When so you many know- things, so many things are coming up for me that I just want to make sure we don't um, forget. So, uh, one one thing is we need to start being better observers of our life, um, of our lives, because there is this sense that oh this is happening to me oh this is happening to me and this is happening to me no No. this is happening for you this is happening for you this sucky experience that you're going through whether it's a divorce or a loss or grief or pain or debilitating um chronic condition whatever it is as awful and difficult as it may be i promise you it is not for nothing. It is not for nothing. These things do not just happen to us for, you know, just because they happen for you. you. If you allow yourself to see through the pain of how you can either connect to someone because you reach out to them and they're able to help you or you through your experience then can help somebody else. Or you simply by saying, I surrender, don't battle it. I surrender. I don't mean give up. I allow the light in. Ram Das has a quote that has always profoundly impacted me. It'll, it'll definitely be in my book. I'll have to give them all the due credit, but we are all here to walk each other home. I change that a little and say, walk each other home to ourselves to the most Mm. authentic place in our being. 
It's these conversations that you are cultivating in this space, in the character mill and the Live Your Extraordinary Life podcast, where we can create incubators for people to recognize you're not just living your life by yourself over there, Chris, and Michelle's living her life over here. Our paths have crossed on purpose. Mm -hmm. There is a reason we needed to meet. We needed to do this particular show and somebody's going to listen to this episode and it's going to impact somebody. There's a reason for all that we do if we allow ourselves to recognize that we are just the vessel. We are the vessel through which the consciousness is moving through higher spirit, whatever you call it, higher power, God, the God force, the universe, whatever you want to call it. I call it God. You call it what you want. But if you recognize that we're spiritual beings having a human experience, then you know that. And th this other thing that one of the gentlemen on my podcast said, in, in fact, he's, he lives in Maine, his name is Peter Panagor. And I thought it was a very profound uh, statement. He said, why Peter, why? If we are really spiritual beings, why must we come and have this human experience? What is the whole point of this? If ultimately we go back to a spiritual existence and he had a near death experience and I, I, he's a very learned man, but he, but he's also somebody who's gone through a lot. I think he's changed his point of view. He has a master's in divinity. He was an ordained minister. He is now considered more of like a Sufi mystic, um, which, you know, the great, uh, you know, a company of like Rumi and, and those kind of Sufi poets. He is a, he's a mystic. He sees the world a little differently. And he said, what is the one thing that the almighty, all knowing unlimited God force cannot experience on its own? Do you know? I would think life in, in, in this living close i mean in sense limitation yeah, and limitation. all limited being cannot experience limitation the only way god can know something outside of itself is through human experience we are god's ability and so why must we go through this and so we had this really philosophical conversation so what's the whole point like we're going to go through the suffering for god and like that ah you know the, all <laughs> of this and he said no it's to show great love the whole point of this, the whole point and why we are here is to, in every instance, how do we choose love and how does God demonstrate love and how do we, what is the whole thing, the whole, all of this, why are we meant, what are we meant to learn from this and know from this one word love? Well, I, I just had to take a deep breath and, and and be with that for a second. Yeah. It's part of the process of you were saying uh, things don't happen to me. They happen for me. And a fellow colleague, Devin Bandison had a 30 day challenge of, I don't, I don't have to do things. I get to do things. To I don't, I don't have to take my spouse to the airport. I get to take my spouse to the airport. I don't have to go grocery shopping. I get to go grocery shopping and same line of some of the simple things that you can do during your day to get into that space of being, I don't want to say being better at loving, but so many people get bogged down. I distinctly, and I'm, this is so off topic, but I distinctly remember sitting at a golf course with an owner of a golf course and he literally spent five and a half hours trying to figure out how he was going to take enough time during the day to bring his tax, his property taxes over to the town hall, which was a mile and a quarter away. But he spent five and a half hours worrying about it. And if he just, and I look back at that, it's so funny, it hasn't popped into my head for 30 years. But as a perfect example, I think how many people live their lives, they get bogged down with, oh, I have to do this and I have to do this. And if you embrace it with like, no, I, I own a golf course, I get to go over and pay my property taxes or what, you know, it opens Which up help fun things in our community. Yeah, it, yeah. Op it opens up the door to, for the opportunity to love. I think. Yeah. I think we have this preconceived notion that life is a be supposed to be a certain way. And that's part of the problem. Right. And, and as soon as something that feels or is um, judged to be negative happens, 
then we're in defense mode, like protect, protect ourselves, protect ourselves. You know, and there's this Chinese proverb, I'm sure you've heard of it, where the Chinese farmer's son who's been gone and lost or whatever finally comes home. It's like, you know, the prodigal son story and, and all the neighbors say, oh my God, what a miracle he's home. And he, he doesn't say, I agree with you. He goes, well, maybe. And then the said son um, falls and breaks his leg and they're like, oh my God, how, how horrible. This is so horrible that this happened. And the farmer goes, well, maybe. And then the army comes through and it, it's drafting, conscripting all of the young, able body men. And his son doesn't get conscripted because um, he's got a broken leg. And they're like, oh my God, you're so fortunate. Oh my God, it's amazing. And he goes, well, maybe. And it just keeps going on and on of like, don't judge what's happening. Just observe what's happening in your life and recognize we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And it is not a nice to have to figure out what your purpose is. It is your job to figure out what your purpose here is because everyone, you, me, all of your listeners, all the people in your listeners' lives are uniquely gifted with some special talent or knowing or DNA coded to be able to do something better than somebody else or whatever that is. Everyone says, oh, I don't have any gifts. And well, that's bunk. Everyone has something that they're good at or something they're inclined to do, something they enjoy. And that thing that brings you joy is your purpose. I happen to love public speaking. A lot of people hate it. I don't know why I was born this way. It was kind of a strange gift. If you ask a lot of people, they're like, I think I'd rather like have my fingernails removed than have to speak in front of, you know, tens of thousands of people. I come alive, give me a crowd, the bigger, the better. And my storytelling, you know, it just comes on fire. I want to tell stories. I want to talk about things and, and parables and, you know, that's my jam. I'm getting better at being alone and being in the silent space and waiting for the downloads, but that's a relatively new thing over the last 25, 26 years. It's not how I started off. It's also important when you, when you say that I, I relate that to when we launched the mill, the app, the goal was to inspire people to go on their adventures. And when people think adventures, they think I got to climb Mount Everest. I've got to jump out of a plane at 20,000 feet. I relate that to what you just said that People, everyone has a purpose. Everyone has a skill. Everyone, that skill may be, maybe is something as simple as volunteering at at a at a local animal shelter and making a yeah. difference in those animal lives. It could be public speaking. It could be becoming president. It could be whatever. It's similar to adventures. We we really promote that. An adventure is we define adventures as embarking on something where the outcome is uncertain. That sounds uh, like the story of my current life. Um, yeah. And it's amazing. Like, look, my father-in-law is a gifted woodworker. He worked in the auto industry in Peru for years and years, years, but he had a secret talent of woodworking and it it's become his thing. It's always been his thing. And they, he's taught us these things and he's passed these things down. I have a 16 year old who does not realize it, but he has got more empathy in his baby finger than anyone I've ever met. And it's to a degree where it's like the level of introspection and compassion that you are, that this child is able to teen is able to display and emote for others. And it, it happens to be a boy, a teenage boy is mind boggling. Like even this mother who's in personal development will be quick to in a moment say something judgmental and I catch myself and he's in a very different plane of empathy, deep, deep empathy. And I think about that and I was like, ah, oh, that is a gift because he sees the world in a, with, through different eyes. He's not jaded and he's seen a lot. It's not a level of innocence. This child is well-traveled, been around, seen a lot more than the average bear. And he still looks for the good. He still looks for the pain point. He still looks to identify the struggle and protect the weak. How many people do that? 
girl, like people... Darwin's theory, we're, we want to hang out with the strong ones. You pick the kid that can That's actually right. kick the ball for the team and the kickball, right? You don't pick the weak kid. And my kid is, he'll sit at the table where the, nobody else is. He'll sit at the table with the, the kid that's all by himself. He'll pick the kid with the least amount of skill. He's a captain of his soccer team. He picks the kid with the least amount of skill to be at his side as his co-pilot because his he sees his job as to, I got to protect this kid and help him get better. That's, that's a per- gift. And that's a pretty proud moment for a parent. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, wait a minute. Oh my gosh, how much am I learning? Like what a it's when you realize these children that you're gifted with are not your, clearly not mine. Like I would have been picked this and then now he's like, <laughs> no, I got to protect him. Don't you see? Wow. Mine yeah. alone. And then I realized these children that we get gifted are, you know, they are that. They are, we are here to help shepherd them through. And oftentimes they're the ones teaching us. But going back just to like, I hope that people come away from this conversation with a deep knowing you may not have sat long enough and still enough and quieted your mind long enough to know what your gift is, but you have one. It doesn't mean that you need to go and write the next New York Times bestselling book. It does not mean you need to get on a stage. You do not need to launch a podcast. You might need to go call your friend or uh, volunteer somewhere or crochet those blankets that need to be crocheted so that those babies who don't have blankets get blankets or those mothers whose babies die and they don't get to bring them home, have the, the hat and, and the booties and, and the blankets that they're going to bury them in. Whatever the gift is, you have a gift. You just need to own it and you need to lean into it. And normally People will say, but that's the thing that brings me joy. How can it be a gift? How can that be my purpose? It's not hard. It's meant to be easy. It's creating that opportunity for people to pause and for people to be uh, reflective. And then ultimately, I think when they do that, they will lean into your word of authenticity, that they will become what they, who they're meant to be. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Yeah, very, very powerful. And I'm sitting here with two pages of notes of things that I wanted to comment on and say, but I also appreciate people's time and and I'm very respectful of their time and of your time that you've given so much of it to me. And for the people that are listening, they've given so much of their time to listen to us banter on. And uh, Michelle, I cannot thank you enough. I the main ties are strong. And so I, I'm, I appreciate you, you know, you appreciate you taking the time to kind of share that. And that word authentic, uh, you, you live it to a T you are a shining example of that. And I think there were so many things that you said that will be relatable for people that I think when they all of a sudden sit back and I hope when people get done this podcast and listening, they will pause and think about how they are authentic man, I think that's when, that's when some beautiful things begin. Thank you for taking this time. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed our conversation thoroughly. I cannot wait to meet you in person. I will be going home at some point during the holidays and I am going to make it a mission to see if we can actually uh, make a connect. Again, thank you so much for everything. Uh, My absolute pleasure. Wow, there were so many great pieces of information in that episode. But that is a wrap for this episode of Character Talks, where authenticity took center stage, and we've had the pleasure of diving deep with the incredible Michelle Rios. From Michelle's corporate escapades to her current love-filled, purpose-driven life, we've uncovered the secrets to living authentically. So, if not now, when? After listening to this episode, we hope you'll also go download The Mill, your new go-to social media platform where every scroll is an invitation to chase adventures, make memories, and live a life free of regrets. Don't miss out. Download it now, and let's let the good times roll. Before you rush off to conquer the world, however, show us some love by liking, sharing, and spreading the joy of character talks. And now, as you go about your day, hit that pause button. Reflect on how authenticity can add a splash of color to your life. Thanks for joining us on this roller coaster of authenticity and fun. Until next time, keep it real, keep it fun. And keep on adventuring. Get just a little bit wet. A bum bum she oh, a bum bum she oh.